The frame forms the backbone of the locomotive. It supports the boiler and carries the wheels, cylinders, spring rigging, draft gear and brake gear. The frame must endure a multitude of loads. Its construction may vary strongly according to available production facilities and the demands put on it. A common type of frame is the plate frame. Here, two steel plates, one and one eighth inch thick, run from the buffer beam to the draft gearbox. The plates are quite flexible sideways. They need to be joined and stiffened as much as possible. This was insufficient on some locomotives, resulting in increased wear of bearings and even frame fractures. The horn gaps are strengthened by the horseshoe type axle box guides. Plate frames are often more than three foot high, which can frustrate maintenance. The bearing for the center pin may move sideways a couple of inches. Most express locomotives had two carrying axles set in a bogey supporting the front end. At least as important was the function of guiding the locomotive into curves. Centering springs ensure that the bogey returned to its middle position. The guiding of the bogey is clearly demonstrated here in the way it cushions the shocks and points the loco's front end into a curve. The 18201 has a so-called bar frame. In these horn gaps, one side is tilted to accommodate wedges. The wedges eliminate any longitudinal play in the axle boxes. A bar frame is indeed a collection of bars. On the lower edge, we see levers, the so-called equalizers. These connect the springs of several axles to spread the effect of bumps. If one axle is pushed up, its neighboring axles are given an extra downward push. The bar frame is low and therefore improves accessibility. It must, however, be supported by buckle plates fixed to the boiler barrel to strengthen it. Lifting the frame without the boiler is not done because it would sag under its own weight. Here, the buckle plates are clearly visible above the drivers. They are intentionally flexible to allow the boiler to expand and contract freely. A trailing axle with inside bearings supports the back end of the German Class 41. This axle is contained in a Bissell bogey that swings sideways in curves. This Belgian Class 1 has an American Delta trailing truck with outside bearings. There is also a centering device at the back. From the 30s onwards, frames in America were cast as a single piece, complete with cylinders, cross members and pump brackets. In one case, even with four cylinders and a length of 77 foot 9 inches. 
such technology was not available in Europe. Following the Second World War, frames in Europe were also welded to form a monocoque type of chassis, as seen here on the German Class 23. In France, André Chapelon had this kind of frame in mind for his standard locomotives, which sadly never became reality. The 23023 is guided into curves by a so-called Krauss Helmholtz bogey. This combines the first load-bearing axle with the first set of drivers. The driver set has side play in the frame whilst the carrying axle swings out. The beam is equipped with centering springs making the whole combination act as a bogey. By the end of the steam age, more and more locomotives had roller bearings fitted instead of plain bearings. Despite the single pony bogey, the Class 23 was intended for passenger service for speeds up to 69 miles an hour and did so in perfect safety with its Kraus Helmholtz bogey. The Krauss Helmholtz bogey was also to be found among Class 52 freight engines. The last driver's set on this 210O also has side play to cope with tight curves. The coupling rod has side play on its crank and the flanges of the main drivers are reduced in thickness. Coupling rods have to be articulated when more than two axles are coupled. Otherwise, the drivers would not be able to move up and down independently to follow the rails. The crank pins on these coupling rods have roller bearings. The driving wheelbase gets long with five sets of drivers, let alone six. Reason enough to split the frame in two and articulate the engine. In its original form, the Mallet is an articulated four-cylinder compound. The rear engine, driven by the high-pressure cylinders, is fixed to the boiler. The low-pressure cylinders drive the articulated front unit, which swivels in curves. In this arrangement, the flexible steam pipes are mainly subject to low pressure steam. Malays have been built as tender locomotives and tank locomotives like those of the Harskvierbahn. In America, the Mallee grew to enormous proportions. Some Mallees of the Virginian featured low pressure cylinders of four feet diameter. This represented the absolute limit. The front engine became very unsteady at any speed exceeding 15 miles an hour. That is why Mallees transformed into four cylinder single expansion articulators like the Challengers of the Union Pacific. The front engine now swivels in a very controlled manner, enabling these freight engines to maintain safe speeds up to 70 miles an hour.
The little 4K represents a prime example of the Maya type of tank engine. Most Maya locomotives were compounds with cylinders facing each other and the high pressure group trailing the low pressure one. Except the obvious difference to the Malley, both engines swivel as bogies. Garrett locomotives have two articulations. The cab and boiler are placed on a cradle slung between two normal engine units. The front unit carries a water tank and the rear unit also carries the fuel supply. This Spanish Garrett, built under license of the Bayer Peacock Company, is oil fired. The beauty of the Garrett was that the weight was spread over many wheels on a long wheelbase, thus creating a powerful locomotive with low axle loading. Like a tank engine, Garretts can run fast both ways. The Class 59 Garretts of the East African Railways in Kenya are the most powerful locomotives in Africa, despite the fact that they run on meter gauge. Their 252 ton weight and 7 foot 6 inch boilers combine to produce more than 83,000 pounds of tractive effort, well beyond the heaviest European freight engine.